Okay, good. Okay, so before I start my talk, I need to have a slight modification for the title. So it's now it's not the finding <laughs> top item factor, but the finding top item factors of a matrix. Okay, so so this is a work joint work with uh Andras Gillian and the Ronald Wolf, and uh, I'm from CWI QSoft and Andras Gillian is from Andre Rennie Institute of Mathematics, and the Ronald De Wolf is from CWI QSoft and the University from Amsterdam. Okay, that's quite long. <laughs> and uh, this is also got uh, accepted for the QRP in 2024 in Taiwan. Yeah. And uh, to start with, let's uh, quickly have some uh, noti uh, notation introduction. So in this talk, I will use, say, capital A as a D by D Hermitian matrix. And I will use the notation lambda 1 to lambda D uh, and the corresponding top icon factor phi i in this way. And now, what is the top icon factor? I think everyone might already know it's just the icon factor with the largest icon value, which quite <laughs> straightforward. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you explain why you're using absolute value notation for these eigenvalues? I mean, isn't it there? Aren't they just real numbers and you list them from uh, small? Or maybe equivalently, does largest eigenvalue mean largest or does it mean largest in absolute value? Yeah, 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 yeah I mean right. larger in the absolute value. And then if right, you're interested in largest in absolute value. Yeah, but if, and, but if you are saying like you really want to find the largest one, then you and uh, if you know the operator norm of a uh, matrix, then you can use in some tricks like adding the identity to make it to to what you like and the remain the gap of it. Okay. So let's uh, reason for simplicity. And then for the purpose I will explain later, I would like to use the notation, which is sort of for uh, I mean ordering in terms of the absolute values. Okay. Yeah, feel free to interrupt me. I mean. I mean, if you guys have any questions. It's like a power, a power message or something. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. And uh, back to the top eigenfactor. Even if, I mean, you say the eigenfactor with the largest eigenvalue, there might be multiple ones, right? And uh, and actually, finding top eigenfactor is sort of some basic problem in lots of fields, like they have a lot of application, like a page rank and the principal component analysis, a feature linear discrimination, constant of the consistent and more. Yeah, this sort of, the space here is too small. I can uh, list off it. Yeah. And how can we find the top eigenfactors? So the most uh, straightforward way is we diagonalize the whole matrix. And then this takes roughly the matrix matrix type metric metric product type, D to the 2.37. Sometimes people will call this 2.37 as the omega, called the matrix multiplication type. But now, since we only want to find the top eigenvector, right? So the question is, can we find it faster if we only want to find the top eigen? Okay. And then this problem is actually already been studied roughly 100 years ago. Suppose we roughly know there's a gap between lambda one and the lambda two. And uh, by the Herman modes, we know the power method can help you to find the approximate type of eigenvector. And the, the algorithm itself is quite straightforward. That is, you first uniformly generate a W0. It's a unit uh, factor. And after that, for each iteration, what you do is you apply your matrix on the w i up w k, and then renormalize this fact and do it over and over and over again. And why it works, the idea looks like it. at the very beginning you have a w zero, and then you can write it in terms of the alpha i phi i, where the phi i is the the base is the the eigenvectors, and then once you apply your a. On this W0, you will end up with alpha j, lambda j, phi j. And then if you do this lots of times, say capital K times, then you will end up with the alpha j, lambda j to the k, phi j. And because we will renormalize the whole factors, so you can see once we know capital K is sort of larger enough, then 
lambda j over lambda one will be really, really, really small. So the leftover component will sort of proportional to the V1. Okay, that's the idea. And uh, actually, we know what's the precise number of iteration which you run. That is roughly one over gamma, ignoring the polylog. <laughs> and the, here I use the notation in the product between W capital K and the V1 instead of the L2 number because I want to get rid of the global phase. Because you might find the, uh, the factor, say, WK, which is sort of really close to V1, but up to the global phase, right? So in this case, if you use L2 known distance, you might have some trouble. So that's the reason I sort of write in terms of something like the inner product instead of the L2 known. But you can think about it sort of, I mean, has this roughly the same direction like the V1. I mean, I, I guess in general, you this can be degenerate the top eigenspace, right? And then it's kind of saying, I guess there exists some vector in V1 in capital V1, yeah, so right, that, that has this property. Okay, and now why power methods? It's because you just said it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So why power method? Like what I said, we don't want to pay the matrix matrix multiplication time. And then if you look at the look power method carefully, you can see for each iteration. We only do the matrix factor multiplication, and then the cost per iteration will be just this square. Okay, that's the main reason why people would like to use power matrix. Because if you use the matrix multiplication time, you can actually find all of the top eigenvectors, right? Oh, sorry, it's sort of cold. <laughs> okay. And and actually, power method is super robust, and uh, we would like to special thanks the simple one, with one of my friends pointing out like uh, the power method is super robust against some small errors, and uh, here's the robust power method, and uh, the robust power method looks like that for each iteration instead of computing a w k, you actually make some mistake, say small mistakes g k. And thanks to the hub enterprise in 2014, they provide a really nice and careful analysis for how the error looks like will still make your promise works. That is, if your error GK is sort of rope, sort of benign. I mean, I will explain the benign later. And so precisely what benign error means is it's error to know is sort of small say epsilon gamma, and one more constraint is your GK in the product with V1 is sort of small. That is the overlapping of, I mean, uh, the more, it, okay, so how do I say this? So the, not most of components of GK lying on the V1. So you would like to expect the, like a GK, if it's like the random error or the Gaussian error, then with roughly one over square root of the B components, you will lie on the V1, right? So typically, sorry, <laughs> yes, so the <don't> code. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Yes. Yeah, but okay. But the back to the benign error. At the end, the benign error means we want to have the small Euclidean norm, and also it sort of roughly has the the, I mean, uniformly distributed over the all direction. I mean, otherwise your GK might. You might have some trouble if your GK are sort of has the same direction of V1. Then you run the noisy power method, then you got trouble. Right. Sorry, in this inner product condition, you know, like these components, like the right hand side is not scaled with respect to the norm of G, right? So just by choosing epsilon to be really small, you can always guarantee that, right? The second condition. Let's say again, you mean the, so the second condition in inner product GK V1 is small, right? Mm -hmm. If you choose epsilon really small, then the norm of G is really small, right? 
therefore the right hand side is always yeah. satisfied, right? Yeah, okay. but uh, but uh, in it's this, not a relative condition, right? Yeah, it's not a relative condition. But uh, if you really want to choose your epsilon to be super small, uh -huh. then in this case, for example, if you use some amplitude estimation, then you will pay the cost of one of epsilon, right? So you don't really want yeah. to pay the cost to be a small something like epsilon over square root of d, which is sort of overkill. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, this is a good uh, question. That is, why we sort of, I mean, why we, I mean, yeah, you can always achieve the second condition by choose by choosing your epsilon to be super super small. But uh, this is not really what we want because we need to pay too much of time to estimate the GK. Okay. So at the end, like what I say we really want this GK to be both small, but also it's sort of lying on the uniformly over the all direction. And then in terms of mathematical language, we want the GK to have both small uh, mean and the small variance. That is both have a nice uh, mean estimation and the second moment bound. Or uh, more general, we would like the GK to be sort of like something like sub Gaussian. And the, the lesser reason is called G, right? It's sort of like we expect to be the Gaussian error. And so now we, we, we would like to go to the quantum part. That is, can we have any quantum speed up for the noisy formats? But actually, what we do is something more general, that is, can we have a quantum speed up for the matrix factor product? That is, we want to have the matrix factor product such that the output will be something with some benign error. And before I explain the, our results, I would like to explain our setup first. So our computational model looks like that. First of all, we store the entry, we assume the entries of matrix A are stored in the quantum readable read-only memory, that is QROM. And then so we are allowed to use some quantum superposition queries to the entries of the matrix. And we assume we have, uh, we can also run the classical algorithm, uh, classical computer and uh, running classical algorithm. So we can run some quantum subroutines. And we are using the quantum readable classical writable classical memory or QRAM. And I know some business people will not like this, but the, because I am the theoristic, so, so I will use it anyway. <laughs> and at the end, as the output, unlike some HHL type algorithm, we would like to output a classical description of the whole fact. So it's a D-dimensional fact. And our time completely counts the number of classical operation and the quantum gates, and also the number of queries to the QROM and the QRAM. Okay. And now this is our result. We can actually find the top approximated top eigenvectors in D to the 1.5 time. This is upper bound. And uh, we also have a nearly optimal lower bound that is d to the 1.5 lower bound. Here we assume the epsilon and the gamma are sort of roughly uh, epsilon, uh, roughly constant. I will plug in the, I mean the the gamma epsilon dependency at the end of the algorithm. So far, so good. And the upper bound, like it's really a little over one in the exponent. It's not. O tilde of d to the one point five. Yeah, it's d. To, yeah, it's o tilde o one in the exponent because we use the some fancy block encoding tricks. Yeah, but uh, even in this case, I think we still have some quantum speed quantum advantage because we know in the classical case your lower bound x square. Okay, and now. Let's back to what we really want to do. So like what I said, we want to have a faster matrix factor product, but now using quantum power. And the two, and uh, here we assume, okay, so here our goal is, we want to do the matrix factor product, but with 
some benign errors. That is, but the error has small mean and a small variance. Okay, so here is the precise goal. Suppose I have a matrix capital A, and I allow the reading the entries of the matrix A and the, the factor W. We want to output an estimated mu such that uh, for the L2 norm between A, W, and the mu is small. And also for arbitrary unit factor, the overlapping between the A, W minus mu in the uh, and the V is sort of small, say epsilon over square root of D. Yeah, of course, it's a high with high probability argument. You cannot say, say with, I mean, simultaneously, all the factor looks like that. But there's typically with high probability for arbitrary uh, unit factor phi, you only have the small overlapping with your error. And here in our paper, we introduced two tools for this faster matrix factor product. So the first tool we call the quantum discrete Gaussian phase estimator. So this tool will end up with a matrix factor product in time d to the 1.75. And this is still provable better than classical. But like what I showed in the previous slide, it's not optimal, but the tricks itself it's quite cool and quite interesting. So I will introduce anyway. And the, the second tool is actually the quantum state tomography with the second moment analysis. And uh, this tool end up with a D to the 1.5 plus or one ton. And the list is near optimal, like what I showed in the previous slide. And now I would like to introduce the first tool that is quantum discrete. Uh, Gaussian phase estimator. So let before I introduce that, I would like to quickly recall what is phase estimation. So phase estimation sort of ask you to estimate the phase of uh, the phase theta given you a uh, unitary u and the corresponding eigenvector per psi. And the algorithm is actually, I mean, I think uh, most of people are quite familiar with that is you start with a uniform superposition over the from zero to capital N. And then you apply the contour UJ on the, the state, and then you will end up with uh, the state, like let, let's say one over square root of N, which is corresponding phase on it. And now if you apply the configuration form on the first register and measure it, you will end up with the uh, estimated theta tilde. And this will guarantee you have a really small additive error if you choose your capital N appropriately. And now what happens in our content discrete Gaussian phase estimation? So what we do is we sort of, instead of prepare the uniform superposition, we prepare the discrete Gaussian distribution. So here I introduce the notation rho s of x, which is sort of like the Gaussian exponential minus s squared with the standard deviation s, that is over s squared. And our algorithm is quite straightforward, that is at the very beginning, we prepare the quantum state, say rho sj, which is a quantum state from minus capital M over two to the capital M over two. And then here's the discrete Gaussian. And we again use the same tricks like the phase estimation. We apply the control, uh, uh, control uj. So we will end up with the phase rho sj and the, the exponential i theta j. Now, if we do the quantum Fourier transform on the first register, we will end up with the discrete Gaussian with its new width, that is, the new standard deviation, capital N over s. And this is this Gaussian will has a peak at the theta. And uh, what's the benefit of this kind of tricks? You will guarantee you like your error is not only small, but it is also sub Gaussian error. That is, it will be a sub Gaussian distribution with this really small standard deviation. So for the sub Gaussian, you can have the, not only for the second moment, you can have the case moment, arbitrary moment control of your error. 
So in this case, how can we use this kind of tool for the approximating matrix factor product? So the idea is quite simple. That is, we encode the row of AJ in the product between row of A and the W. The question just to, to, to understand a bit better the like okay. how, how to apply the discrete Gaussian phase estimation. So is the idea like, um, say if my goal is to, I mean, say I want to do ordinary phase estimation, I want to estimate theta to some accuracy then, since I'm anyways happy with this accuracy, I could also apply Gaussian phase estimation with a standard deviation of the error I'm willing to tolerate. And then I, I get the additional benefit that I have good tails. Uh, uh, like how, uh, like, you know. I think a tail, I mean, I mean for the tail, it's already quite, uh, okay. So, I mean, in the original phase estimation, I think the tail is already quite nice. Yeah, because tail is sort of in presence of the 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 first moment, first moment error. And then here for the Gaussian phase estimation is sometimes if you want to estimate the whole factor and then the error, and the, for each entry, you might incur some errors, right? And in this case, if you count, uh, compute the L2 now of this error, then if you don't really have the good control of the second moments of those errors, then your error in the worst case can be really, really bad. And the less the motivation why we introduce the quantum discrete Gaussian phase estimator here, because we can sort of ensure like uh, in this case, the error you produce is a sub Gaussian. And in this case, when you try to compute the say bunch of error adding together, then it's still a sub Gaussian. Is it like plug and play? Like, I mean, in the sense of, I don't know, suppose I'm, I'm willing to invest so and so many qubits for my, or, or, or let's say, suppose I'm interested in an additive error of Delta. Mm -hmm. Should I always use discrete Gaussian phase estimation? No, I think uh, if you only care about the, the Delta additive error, then you should use the. I think. I mean, like, do I get some of the, the good statistical properties for free, kind of, or do you do you have to pay yeah. the price? Yeah, I think the cost is exactly the same. So, so you can anyway use the. <laughs> yeah, the, do this. Yeah. But uh, I think in general, people would think to prepare the uniform superposition is easier than to prepare the. Uh, actually, I'm not sure about it because, I mean, in physics, sometimes people feel like the Gaussian state is actually more. <laughs> more reasonable, but the, but the here for us, because we can anyway, I mean, theoretically, we can anyway yeah. compute the discrete the Gaussian uh, distribution that is this state at the very beginning and the, using the roughly the same cost as well. So, so I'm anyway fine with that, but I'm not sure how practical this trick will be. But the, it's end up with something like the extra properties, so extra guarantee for your errors. So even if you end up with a bunch of errors, you want to add an of land together, then you can sort of ensure like, okay, it will be the new sub Gaussian. And then you might have some extra property to make use of. Yeah, let's sort of the, let's the reason we feel this is a cool trick. <laughs> but the, at the end, it doesn't give us a really the tight fun, but, but it's a good, it's a good trick. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other question? I mean, I have one naive question that I almost don't dare asking. Um, so, so I thought sub Gaussian means the tails are e to the minus t squared. You know, like the probability of being you know, t far away means Gaussian tails. But before you said something, it's not about the tails. It's about something else. So I was confused. Uh, I, I think the, the point is like, uh, OK, so, so I mean, OK, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I think if you yeah, so let me, yeah, true. I think it's the, the more strict detail you are asking for. But the, if you only care about the, say, small additive error, that is with high probability, something is epsilon uh, close to the other one, then you don't really need to have really good control of, say, higher moment, right? Because sub Gaussian tail is actually something stronger. Yeah, but I mean, you, it's like for all epsilon, right? You have to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Add, like, e to the minus quadratic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's a stronger tail. That's at least the definition I understand. Okay. Yeah, I see. yeah, yeah. Let's, let's also the definition <laughs> I have in my mind. Yeah. Matrix vector. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. But now back to the matrix factor product, how can we use the quantum discrete Gaussian phase estimator to estimate the, the matrix factor product? So the idea is like uh, we first use some block encoding tricks to encode the inner product between the row of A and the W. And then after that, we uh, apply the discrete Gaussian, uh, content discrete Gaussian phase estimated. Yeah, it's sort of a <laughs> lot. And uh, we do this for, say, for, for the every I in D. So we will end up with the D dimensional factors, right? But the only downside of all this method is the encoding process is sort of time wasting. It's actually query, I mean, the in terms of query is tight, but in terms of time, you need some extra, I mean, extra test set to deal with. So that's the reason you cannot reach the 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 d to the 1.5 time complexity. Instead, instead it reach the d to the 1.75. Okay, now the second method I want to introduce is the state tomography with the second moment guarantee. And uh, this problem will be looks like that. Suppose we have copies of quantum state, say cat uh, phi, which is sort of the, the cat zero, cat per side plus the cap zero perp. And here the cat per is non non-normalized state. So it might have the L2 norm, which is less than equal to one. And our goal is to learn the classical description of Psi with both small L1 norm, L2 norm, and, uh, with, uh, and uh, with small the covariance uh, error. And the algorithm itself is quite easy. That is, we just measure each of them and then in the computational basis, and then we try to count the normalize the number of outcome with respect to the computational basis. And uh, in the or this is already known in the uh, uh, Afardom uh, Connison uh, and, and uh, Ning Lynch's a paper that's year that is if you're doing something like that you will end up with the unbiased estimate that is your your first uh, moment error is really really nice and what we do here is we carefully analyze the covariance matrix of the error factor to ensure like okay the operator norm of the covariance matrix of this error factor will be really small which means its second moment error is also really, really small. Okay. And so how, again, how can we use the state tomography tricks to approximate the matrix factor product? So the idea is like, uh, we first, uh, the idea is to implement the bracket according of capital A, and then prepare a bunch of quantum state capital A apply on the capital W. And uh, by the Rose 2019 result, we know the cost of implementing the block encoding of capital A takes D to the 0.5 time plus the small O1. And that's the reason where we, why we have the small O1 in the component. So in the, and then by using the state tomography tricks, we know if we prepare D of epsilon number of copies of the state AW and main measure, we can have a good approximate for the factor AW. So the total cost will be square root of D times D to the epsilon, which is D to the 1.5 over epsilon. And now plugging everything back to the noisy power method, we can estimate the top eigenvectors in time d to the 1.5 over gamma epsilon. Here, gamma is the gap between the lambda one and the lambda two. And the epsilon is the, L, the L2 non error you would like to achieve. And actually, we recently generated this result for finding the top Q eigenspace. That is, we can approximate the, uh, sorry, top Q eigenspace in Q times D to the 1.5 time 
or with the same gamma and the epsilon dependency. How does it work? Do you maintain like a subspace at each point of Q, like some also also like some gram schmidt thing? Like how what's the uh yeah, the algorithm is slightly complicated. It's actually not the, the noisy power, uh it's inspired by the noisy power mess. But the algorithm is typically we prepare a bunch of the mm -hmm. uh the the Gaussian vector at the very beginning. And then we use some quantum singular value transform. Uh, tricks to sort of like uh, to to convert the matrix A to the projector onto the top two eigenspace, and then we use some some singular value transformation tricks to say okay if we we're doing this and uh, and uh, for each iteration we can ensure like the error is sort of small then we are okay yeah the the algorithm is slightly more complicated. <laughs> Here, this gamma is the gap between the, the lambda q and the lambda q plus one. Yeah. Yeah. Here is also uh, might be something some useful corollary is we we know we know how to estimate the lambda q in times square root of q times d over gamma if we know there's a gap between lambda q and the lambda q plus one. Yeah, but uh, it's slightly too complicated, so I will uh, carefully introduce in this slide. So, any questions? We are typically done with the upper bound part. So I I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, no. yeah. So so actually here the lump, the you need this big gap between exactly where you want to um, say so if you want to find the top q then you need the gap between the q and the q plus one yes so but if um so but the such such a large gap is is not going to be all over the place because uh right so you can just have so basically, this requires to have the gap just in the right place. So, so that's that's sort of funny because it's very unlikely that you have gap between the q q um, plus one, the q minus one q, the q minus one two q. So, so what I'm saying is that basically your the, your matrix in this case just forces you to basically forces upon you just the one particular Q for which you can use this trick. That That's what I wanted to remark here, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, but I think that, uh, I mean, I think the same idea is also true for the finding the top eigenvectors. That is, you always need to have some information about the gap between- I Yeah, mean, yeah, 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 I, I agree. But like, there are a lot of cases when so it's natural to have a large gap between the largest and the second largest. But like, if you want the thousands and the thousand plus ones, there is it's not natural to have there like a large gap. Um, but in any case, I, I mean, I, I'm just saying that like if the user, um, if the user sort of randomly has to decide what the queue should be, then I think you you don't end up with this kind of speed up because then the gap is typically going to be one over d or something like that. I, yeah, I but I think uh, uh, you can anyway find that the how large q is right. Suppose you know there's a maybe there's a gap uh, somewhere between some some unknown q and the q plus one. Then you can sort of using some tricks to sort of within d to the one point five ten to find the, where is the q roughly be, and then after that you can estimate the corresponding lambda q, and then apply the quantum singular value transform tricks to end up with this result, right? Yeah, I didn't understand that, but I I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I want to ask the same kind of so so kind of you can kind of you say you can figure out kind of 
Okay, suppose I, I, I promise you there's a good gap somewhere, but I don't know where, you know, is it like between the first and second or between the eigenvalue 700 and 701? Mm -hmm. You can kind of figure out what Q is in, in like time. What did you say, O of D to the 1.5 roughly? Yeah, I guess it should be something like the D times uh, D times Q, actually. I think it should be D times Q. But uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, we did not really carefully write it down in the, I mean, because we assume we have a gap, but uh, we don't really carefully uh, think about the case when Q is sort of unknown. But I think uh, the the tricks we use for estimating lambda Q should be should sort of apply for this case that is to sort of find the 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 the, the approximate the lambda uh, the 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 price of Q. But uh, I think we can discuss this. I mean later. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like the power of of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the power in the seminar room is sort of gone for some reason. Hello, we've <laughs> suffered some <laughs> power <laughs> failure. <laughs> See, great. <laughs> Sorry, did you say something? Uh, I see and <laughs> yeah. yeah. You won't learn here, so yeah, yeah, yeah. we yeah. We're trying to fix it. As we speak, oh, the lights are still on. Yeah, it's really weird. The lights are still on, <laughs> but this is yeah, everything here has gone off. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just bear with us. But these lights are off here on the buttons. <laughs> On and, 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 and I guess you're still sharing the screen, right? So I guess you guys are just fine. There, wow. Okay, so can everyone hear me right now? Okay, yeah, sorry for the technical issues, even though I, yeah, yeah. So, so right now I'm using my laptop directly. So, okay. So back to the previous question asked by Sekdi, I I think the the tricks we use for estimating lambda q should sort of I mean should be sort of okay to help us to find the, where q is, but uh, we can dis uh I need to carefully write it down, but I think it will not be a like big issue actually, and actually. If you don't care about too much of the Q dependency, you can actually directly run the noisy power method. Then you will directly give you something like the, the poly Q times D to the 1.5 over gamma epsilon time. But the, the, we, we were sort of unhappy about the Q dependency. And the less the reason, we sort of try to use some quantum singular value transformation to estimate the lambda q and then plug in to compose to 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 contract the plug encoding of the projected. Okay, so so far so good. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the technical issue. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Even though it's not my fault, but <laughs> I feel sorry about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Now let's go to the low bound part. So right now we have a d to the one point five upper bound. So we would like to show a d to the one point, roughly d to the one point five query low bound. So at the very beginning, a natural way is to try to find a hard instance. So what kind of hard instance? 
is a reasonable hard for quantum. So here, the hard instance we define is we let uh, a hard instance define the following way. That is, we have a U, which is binary minus one, one to the D. And we have a noisy matrix, which is entries of this noisy matrix is uh, IID uh, Gaussian error draw from the N0, one over four to the 10, six over D, roughly one over D. And now we let our matrix will be something like a one over D times U, U transpose plus capital N, okay? So you can think about, we are now trying to hide the information of U inside the error, large of error, which is capital N. And now if you look at the, the entries of AIA, then you will see each entry is actually like N drawing from N U I U J over D with its, uh, co with its variance roughly one over D. That is your mean is roughly one, is either one over D or minus one over D. But your standard deviation is roughly one over square root of D. So it's actually quite hard to distinguish the one over D from the minus one over D, right? Because your standard deviation is way too large than your mean. And now, what's our goal? Our goal is to recover, say, 99% of entries of U. And if you can find the top eigenvector of capital A, you can actually use this top eigenvector, approximate the top eigenvector to recover, say, 99% of the information of U. Okay. And by some random matrix uh, tricks, we can show something like the the gap for this matrix, uh, the spectrum gap for this matrix is quite big, say constant. So in this case, it's sort of like the easiest case because we have the the constant gap and also the constant L2 non L <laughs> you can think about. Sorry? Like how, how do you know that the difference is constant for lambda one and lambda two? Yeah, we okay. So the idea is like uh, uh, yeah. How to, so 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 okay. So let's see. So let me. So the point is okay. So if you ignore the, the noise part, so you just look at the one over square root of d u u transpose, then this uh would have the say the top eigenvector one. Uh, attack eigenvalue one, right? With eigenvector is u, right? And now, then you just look at the. the... Yeah, it's one over d. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one over d is to make the, 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 the I mean, the matrix is so everything normalized. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worry, no worry. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, annoying. But sometimes I also struggle with the <laughs> normalizing issue. Yeah. And, and the one is one and number two is zero. Right? Uh, roughly zero. Yeah, roughly zero because it's sort of like a noisy metric. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, of course, you, you need to some random matrix uh, tricks to show this is true with high probability. Yeah, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And now, Let's see why this is hard. Say a classical example. So if you want to learn entries of U, like what I said, you sort of have to distinguish N one over zero, N uh, one over zero from N minus one over zero, one over zero, uh, one over D, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And you need to distinguish those two cases, right? And if you compute the KL divergence, of those two samples is actually roughly say one over D. So you sort of need a number of D queries to learn one entry. And now, because you want to learn 99% of the entries, say the 0.99 D entries, so you would intuitively think you need D times 0.99 D number of queries to learn of, uh, say roughly all of them. So let's the D square. Now, how can we generalize 
this lower bound to the say quantum lower bound to have the d to the 1.5. So our idea is suppose we have a capital T query algorithm A that recover say 99% of U. Then by some average argument, there will be a really, really good index I such that your matrix, your algorithm capital uh cap graphic A can make at the most uh, 40 over uh, 40 over D number of queries to the ice row and the column, and then learn the UI with high probability, say 0.9 or 0.8. Okay. So it suffice to show like uh, if we want to learn UI correctly with high probability, you really need say square root of D low bound. So can I can I have a question? Yeah. So we are talking about the quantum lower bound, right? Yeah, yeah. So why? So how can you say that the quantum queries the I? Uh, I mean, it queries a superposition. So what does it mean that you are querying the I through and column? Yeah, so and we what we this. actually mean is something like the quantum query mess. So it's the quantum query mess we spend on the ice current and the row. But then now for the simplicity, I just say that it's actually the queries. But the, at the end, when we try to convert it to the to the to the to to the I mean the rigorous uh row bound. We, what we what we are mean what we mean here is actually the query mesh sort of defined in terms of like the yeah how hmm, like it's it? in the adversary argument yeah yeah in the adversary argument exactly exactly yeah so it's actually query mesh instead of the query like you say it's intense query intense of a superposition so you cannot directly say the the query. So what we are meaning here is query mess. But uh, I mean, it's slightly complicated to introduce the idea of the query mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, the idea is roughly the same. By the same average argument, the query mess you spend on the ice current in the row is at the end 40 over Q, 40, or 40 over, over D. Sorry. <laughs> so at the end, one. If one really want to show D to the 1.5 low bound for, for this problem, it suffices to show like to recover UI, you need say square root of D, uh, number of quantum queries to distinguish the N one over D, one over D from N minus one over D, one over D. Okay. And now let's quickly explain how we show this. Yeah, it's a really rough, I mean, really high level intuition. Of course, to make everything rigorous, you need to, like uh, uh, like Mario suggested, you need to have some quantum mass argument in the, say, the, the weighted adversary method. So our method is exactly the, at the first in Mesa, but with some technical modification, because we would like to consider everything in terms of the continuous distribution. So we would, what we do is we consider the joint distribution mu on pairs of matrix. And then there are actually the joint distribution X and Y, which conditioned on UI equal to one and the UI equal to minus one. And we sort of show like the expected progress of the, I mean, the adversary measure in one query will be the expectation of the Hamming weight between X and the Y over D. And by the careful calculation, which is actually quite complicated, I will ignore everywhere anyway, is roughly square root of D. So at the end, we know one progress uh, progress per query is actually one over square root of D, which implies you would need square root of D number of queries to distinguish the, those two cases. And now at the end, you just plug in this together, uh, to, uh, plug in this back, that is T over D is uh, omega square root of D. Then you end up with your capital T is D to the 1.5 global. 
Okay. Uh, let's. Yeah, I sort of we can know lots of technical calculation here. Yeah, but the the, the calculation is actually quite complicated. Yeah, like uh, Mario Mario sort of point out, you have to use some something like the query mesh, and you also have to carefully calculate the joint distribution and the expectation of the Hamming weight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are some. Yeah, yeah, but but it sounds cool. It's like. Uh, sort of the uh, the the Erdős is random method in a quantum setting, so it's like the quantum Erdős random yeah. method, something like. That. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I, like... I I think uh, I mean I'm not fully sure, but I feel like uh, Ambinus sort of has the should Ambinus should already have roughly the same idea in his weighted adversary method, but uh, he's not considering in let us uh, say continuous random variable way, but because it's sort of like quite complicated. But I think he should already know something like that. But uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, in our case, because we really want to show d to the 1.5 low bound, so we we try to invent by i mean from scratch yeah because if yeah, you directly uh, plug in the adversary bound you will end up with the d low bound instead of d to the 1.5 yeah but what i meant on the uh, on the random method is that um like so you are basically it's enough to show that there exists a matrix right so so the other method always shows the existence of something so even if you just exhibit one matrix mm -hmm. for which uh, it works badly, then um, then you are done. And so the Erdős method is always to show that if so, you have a random assembly of matrices. Then actually, not only that there exists one of those, but on average, actually many of those are gonna be bad. And so that requires like a lot of averaging. So yeah. basically here it seems like you are doing a lot of extra averaging because you have this random assembly, I guess Gaussian assembly, and and so you have to average over uh, that randomness. And so you are showing that uh, with large probability, um, like actually your matrix is going to have large complexity. Um, yeah, right? true, yeah. actually, yes. Yeah, I did not really think in this way because I was, I I I saw that I mean, Ambinus should already have a roughly idea. Yeah, let's say that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah, let's yeah. Maybe with minus signs in the probability. Yeah. Learned that the small ensemble yes and no maybe it's often easier to calculate rather than the Yeah, true. And you have to try to find one pair of contact zones. Yeah, I think at least our idea is typically exactly from the weighted the first method. That is, you are just uh, think about some yes and no instance and sort of weighted overlap. Yeah, but uh, like uh, Michael said, you really need a lot of effort to deal with some continuous <laughs> random variable because it's sort of annoying. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason we feel like it should be a kind of weighted uh, the first method. Yeah, uh, I mean, of course, it includes some random matrix analysis, but it's not that part of content uh, of the first method. Yeah. Okay. Very important, maybe it's becoming not not too sure, you know, but I mean, often somehow there's, so for example, if I have an, uh, an expectation of, of a continuous distribution, but my random number takes space and I say, find the number to space, like you can always replace it, right? I have a discrete distribution that becomes a happy majority. Yeah. Similarly, so it could be that uh, maybe there could be a more complicated proof that does not involve, you know, like continuous Gaussians and conditioning of continuous variable members. But it might actually be nicer to do it, or, or is it? Is it here that it really it's not so correctly though it's not applied. It's I like, like a more powerful method as part of the use. If you, if you didn't, if you ran it out the integrals. 
Uh, I think, uh, I mean, at the very beginning, we uh, we were actually trying something like to discretize all the, the continuous caution, but uh, we had uh, some, I forget what issue with that. I mean, but uh, I had the impression that it was, we sort of have some we issue with some, 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 some total variation distance between the continuous and the, the discrete Gaussian ones. So at the end, we directly include the 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 continuous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So more or less, then we can some expressivity, but I guess we kind of know that the most general experiment in any way is characterizing very complexity or so we could maybe say. Okay. <laughs> like it's it's like maybe it's just like a maybe a, a very practical, a, a very useful tool for for like theory problems that are about continuous inputs. Is that kind of a, yeah. A, sure. a factor. Yeah, true. Actually, we did not carefully think about it because we just think it's just a kind of weighted at the first remains. Yeah. Well, I, said, I think one issue could be with the discrete is, for instance, if you just took random plus one, minus one matrices and you add this extra matrix, I think just because of the... So you just look at an entry and you just figure out that what is doubled and what is not, or something like that. So, so be, because the um, like the Gaussian distribution sort of hides like the the entries, like when you add like a, a particular like quantized quantity, like one over d or whatever, it will not jump out. Uh, so. Um, in any case, so I think if you want to hide your uh, your extra matrix, then it should be sort of smoothly shifting variant or something like that. Uh, so maybe that's the reason, but I'm just guessing. Yeah, there might be the reason because uh, I mean because uh, we sort of district type list at the very. At the very beginning, that we had some troubles, but I already I forget that that's what which trouble is. But maybe it's something like you said, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we really spend lots of time on the lower bound, actually. Yeah, it's even more time than the upper bound because the upper bound is. I think the idea of upper bound is quite. I mean, quite straightforward. Like this, we want to have a good guarantee for the second moment, and that we have a noisy problems this time. And then for the low bound, we sort of struggling more. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks for the discussion and the sense for pointing this out. Yeah. And now maybe let's back to the slide because it's uh, the last slide, the summary and the future works. And so in our paper, because we want to find the, uh, have a festival algor algorithm for the approximate uh, type icon vector, we invent some tools for the first uh, uh, algorithms for approximate uh, the matrix vector product. And our tools include, our tools include quantum discrete Gaussian phase estimator and the quantum state tomography with second moment guarantee. And at the end, we can approximate the top icon vectors in terms of like, uh, uh, if for top icon vector is d to the 1.5 over gamma epsilon, and then for the low bound we show is d to the 1.5, say the d dependency is tight. And then for the top q eigen space, we can do in the d, uh, q times the d to the 1.5 with the same gamma epsilon dependency. And there are some future works. So first of all is, can we use the something similar tricks we introduced here to do a faster approximate matrix matrix multiplication? This is something we think is most interesting because I think uh, matrix matrix multiplication time is already there for quite a long time. So if someone, anyone else can sort of provide a quantum Based uh, matrix matrix multiplication will be amazing. And uh, the second thing is, can we for the upper bound of the quantum algorithm improve the gap dependency from one over gamma to one over square root of gamma? Because in the classical case, we know the one over square root of gamma is the right dependency. 
And the, the, the last is, can we have a quantum low bound for approximating the top Q eigenvectors? I mean, like the while we discussed the, uh, the, I mean, the low bound for quantum, quantum low bound for approximating top eigenvector is already quite, quite hard, I mean. <laughs> and then we don't know how to adjust this for the top Q or uh, to plug in the gamma, uh, the gamma dependency into the low bound. <laughs> yeah, we were, we, we, we are really interested about it, but we don't have a good, uh, ideas right now so so can i can i just say that like let's say the state of the art was still strassen and not the copers with vinograd or whatever then you would have a quicker matrix matrix multiplication because then you have like exponent 2.5 yes exactly of, so so actually, it's just your bad luck that there was all these copper smith Vinograd <laughs> and sort of, which, which are really crazy methods, because even the Strassen is <laughs> very tricky, but these are completely crazy, these others. So, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, in my opinion, I will, I mean, even in D2D 2.5, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, a kind of a different method would be interested, at least to me, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So I think you, you already have something in the quicker matrix matrix. I mean, yeah. because like like your trick is nothing like Strassen and you are getting better than Strassen. So I think, yeah, maybe it's very promising, actually. Yeah. <laughs> for example, um, basically, as I'd say, an algebraic algorithm or something like would that imply anything directly for my two point conjecture? I think also not okay. I'm not, I'm not sure here. Yeah. I mean, of course, obviously, like the whole decomposition, yeah, 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 okay. matrix yeah. multiplication, but uh, but only one I give actually, okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, but, but like, so, so, so actually, yeah. let me take it back though, because like you need this big gap, right? And so this big gap is is sort of a uh, it's crucial to your algorithm. Oh yeah, also, right? that's also true. Yeah, I guess right, but you don't usually so, see not the right word, right? But it's I guess part of the condition number. Yeah, and it works for random matrix, right? <laughs> yeah. About this top Q eigenspace, I mean, I go sort of, I, I didn't exactly hear Mario's question to her, so maybe he, he commented on this, like, if, but I guess, yeah, if, if Q is like squared of D, then it's kind of not interesting anymore, right? Like, then yeah, you could just plus, read the matrix and do it in force processing. Is, yeah. it, is there like a, what do you think is the right answer? That if, if Q is even, yeah, not, no, let's say uh, between squared of blue and D. I think that the right dependence yeah. I have in my mind should be square root of b times square root of q times b to the 1.5 plus qd. I think that this mm -hmm. should be the correct answer, but I have no, I have no proof. <laughs> square root of q times d to 1.5 plus q times d. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I guess yeah, q times d is like because that's what you have to output. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Oh, yeah, but I don't know how to. I mean, because for the top Q project, you unmute. Sorry, because I think I can't have. Yeah, sorry. Uh, now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so because I mean, yeah, because we sort of for the Q dependency for the top Q subspace, I mean, the algorithm itself is actually showing like if you want to find the top Q projector, it's sort of tight. You need say Q times D number of queries to the block encoding of them. So in this case, I mean, in terms of the finding the top Q subspace, 
it's sort of tight. So, so in this case, uh, uh, by using our algorithm, we don't know how to further improve the Q dependency. So that's something really I'm sort of unhappy about, but <laughs> but I <laughs> yeah, but I, I have no idea too to further improve for the Q dependence. I think a Q is already sort of tight in for, for, for our type of algorithm because our algorithm is exactly to find the the sub the the write down the Q rank project. And uh, I think it's tight. I mean it's actually tight actually. Yeah. So yeah unless I mean so in this case if you want to further improve the Q dependency from Q to square root of Q, you, I think you should uh, uh, look for totally different method instead of our method. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. More more questions from from anyone? I mean, I congratulate you on. Yeah. Inadvertently uh, having destroyed them. How of your of your presentation? No, no. Yeah. So can I can I ask a, um, <clears throat> an additional cool question? <laughs> maybe it's okay, but it's still cold. Right now. <laughs> yeah, it's still cold. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, very yes. cool work. Very cool. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, bye. Bye, everyone. On time. Unless there's any further questions online, we yeah. to be asked. I'm not sure if they can not hear me. Yeah. <laughs> I think Harry wanted to ask another question. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, yeah. I think Harry wanted to ask another question. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I wanted to ask that if you, that if the top eigenvalue, that if the top eigenvalue is, has multiplicity Q, then can you find it in square root of q times times z to the 1.5 so that the largest has multiplicity q you can repeat or you could bring your laptop yes thank you <laughs> sorry say again <laughs> I just said that if the that if the largest uh, eigenvector has eigenspace dimension q, can you find it square root of q times d to the one point five? So you are saying we have q uh, top eigenvectors, right? Then yeah. Yeah, because it seems like like it's kind of a Grover search, and so I don't I don't think find so. few things with Grover search you can do in square root of Q. Um, so because you find one one of those like in in uh, d to the one point five, and so you now you need to find Q of those. Yeah. Um, they are all in the uh, they are all in this uh, invariant subspace. Um, so it seems like with Grover search, you sort of, you can always just square root things. So, uh, <laughs> and so you have to find Q now instead of, yeah. Okay. But in any case, I, yeah, but, uh, I, okay. So I think, uh, at least, uh, for our algorithm, we cannot do this. Yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe there might, I mean, I don't know, because I don't really have a low bound for the Q dependency. So so maybe other types of algorithm can do that, but uh, I don't think our algorithm can sort of find the top Q eigenspace in, say, square root of Q times D to the 1.5. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, as what I said, our algorithm is actually saying, like, you can find the the projector with rank Q in time Q times D, right? And uh, in this case, the Q dependency for the corresponding projector is sort of tight. And uh, in our algorithm, we really need Q here, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. at least I don't know how to improve our algorithm from the Q dependency to uh, from Q to square root of Q. 
and the lesser region I saw the book. <laughs> yeah. That's like a nice okay. like a uh, sub problem to think about now because I might remove some of the complexity of the general question and it still seems not obvious. Yes. But... Can I add with what does it mean to find an uh, obtuse substrate? Like, does it mean being able to sample from it, or does it mean like you want the bases? Like... Yeah, you want to write down the the q times d. I mean, uh, q times d entries or the the q q. So q... The basis, basically. Yeah, basis. Q many d dimensional basis. In this case, like, like how are you going to like, just avoid Q complexity, right? Yeah, but, but the thing is that this is 1.5, right? So currently, yeah, I, I see. So I think that's why you said maybe square root of Q times D for the 1.5 plus Q times D. Yeah, I see. So the max are kind of awkward. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. annoying. I, I agree. I mean, I, I also spend uh, sometimes, I mean, say roughly. Uh, one or two months after after this works done <laughs> to think about it, but I don't have have a good answer for it. Yeah. But sampling one vector from top two subspace, what's the complexity of that? See, that's fine, know? right? In your case, I mean, if you um, just need to find one, you just run your power method with like a random yeah, vector, yeah. and it's going to be great. The the operator yeah. doesn't depend on Q. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if it's. Probably the, it's not relevant, but it's only logarithmic improvement. The fact that you actually have maybe a high, like suppose Q is really large, mm -hmm. maybe maybe a, a constant fraction of the dimension. I guess you really have a good overlap when you start, but that's probably not helpful, right? It only gives a logarithmic improvement because of the yeah, improvement. true. So, yeah, true. if I understand correctly, so this is like separate two submethods, right? One of them samples from the subspace, and then from the subspace, you need to like. I mean, sampling from the subspace is there's more complex than the something, even 1.5 without Q. And then the idea no, no. is like if you want to do, if you want to find the base, you just need to do it. No, the D to the 1.5 gives you the description of the top eigen vector, not the sampling. Yeah. Uh, no, no, like, okay, you assume that if you first multiple, you start with a random one, one, so you get, yeah, you get yeah, yeah, in some yeah, sense, you one. kind of sample yeah. 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 from a uniform leading one. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, if they are like the same, if first two eigenvalues are the same, yeah. that is just yeah. samples from that subspace. Right. Yeah. yeah, from the subspace, I think it's true. Yeah, because I think our, I mean, our algorithm, I mean, the for finding the top Q rank, uh, the rank Q projector is typically we uh, run the uh, run the, the noisy power measure with lots of time and each time we end up with a vector roughly uniformly draw from the top Q yeah. eigenspace. Yeah, and uh, this for one is just uh, say say D to the 1.5, but we need to repeat this say, say constant times Q times. Yeah. But, okay. So that's... I can't, can't you use amplitude amplification? Uh, maybe that's stupid because it's yeah, somehow... but, uh, but at the end you uh, okay, so but at the end, uh, you... I mean, it's just the buzz big because, like, here you want to find all the all the coefficients, yeah, okay. exactly. And so it's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's sort of hard. <laughs> Yeah, but it's an interesting question. I was I would like to say, yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe something silly. I don't. I think I missed something. But the law quantum law bond does not depend on this gamma. I yeah, think. I mean, in the quantum law bond, we assume both gamma and the epsilon is constant. Ah, so like. So I was wondering like, to answer Mario's question, like if if you consider like arbitrary gamma, then maybe you can find a slightly faster thing, like because like if you want to like in the Grover search case, when you want to compute all exam like all outputs, you'll have something like square root n over k mm -hmm. times k, which will give you square root nk complexity. So mm -hmm. if your matrix algorithm considers like non-constant gamma, maybe we can still push it down to like d power 1.5 divided by root gamma. Um and then, yeah, maybe that times Q, I mean, it's still not root Q yet, but you can probably still get something better than. Uh, I don't okay. understand. So you are saying like, uh, so I have my gamma to something like gamma over Q? Oh, or... sorry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think I was 
I realized that the gamma is missing, and maybe if you account for both gamma and Q, like the so Q as in the multiplicity of the largest eigenvector, mm -hmm. when you consider the lower bound, maybe you get like something small, smaller. Uh -huh. Gamma is equivalent to the gamma cubes. Um, no, 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 sorry. Like the gamma missing reminded me that there was some assumption in the lower bound, which was not made in the upper bound, because mm -hmm. the lower bound does not have these terms. Yeah. So I was wondering if, like, if you also account for this multiplicity, maybe you get a better complexity, um, like, than just. Yeah, the but there is for the lower bound, right? For the upper bound, we don't know how to do this. And for the lower bound, we don't we don't even know how to plug in the gamma and the exactly. and the Q dependence. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, I was wondering, like, let's say. All the eigenvectors are except one at top, and then the other one is something smaller, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, the, the upper bound somehow like still does not change at all, even though like almost the entire space contains the. In this case, we further search for the bottom and then take a total look of the. Yeah, but but the small no, no, no. absolute value is very hard could be very hard to find, right? It's like a tiny perturbation, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Do you know where where the where yeah, you yeah, go? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um oh, yes, I'm not one else. Yes. Otherwise we've just lost all seven. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so, so I guess I guess there's two meanings to large, right? I'm here large was an absolute value. So small means very close to zero. So that's so it's this orthogonal complement trick I was also thinking about before, but it actually doesn't work, right? Wait, I mean, because like like you, it, there's, it's not obvious, I think, how to find the smallest eigenvector in a, efficiently. Um, like so just class to gamma, gamma identity from, from your matrix. And you get, can, can you say again? You subtract gamma times identity. Well, like if you know the, the, top, the, the top guy exactly or... Yeah. Even if you make a small error, I mean, like then I guess then it's a bit about the, the, the ratio. I mean, it's still make. it's it's still more efficient. Like no, you, you can find the top eigenvector, you can find the eigenvalue. Yeah, so some use approximation, and now this approximation has to be of the order of the smallest eigenvalue, right? Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So like, like let's like say one you one over d, right? Then it's kind of probably bad. Maybe like, I don't know. Like you're saying that if we knew the exact eigenvalues, you can find this. Uh, like you can do this thing faster, like computing the top eigenvector or something. I think, no, I think I think the first thing I said is that it's I think it's not super obvious that if 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 you're in this easy situation where all the eigenvalues are one except for one eigenvalue but it's yeah. small, how to find this the small no, like, eigenvector? But, and I'm asking, and find let's it say you knew that like you're given that value like everything is one and the last one. Yeah, exactly. Is so, like, yeah, so I'm so saying like if yeah, well, if you knew it was exactly one, I think maybe life would be a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because that's like uh, what would change? Like, I, like I'm trying to see in terms of the complexity. Like, how would the algorithm be faster if you knew the exact uh, eigenvalues? So I guess yeah, the proposal was to to subtract the identity in your mind, and now it's a it's a matrix that has only zero eigenvalues plus one eigenvalue, which is uh, uh, one minus the small number from before. Yeah. And now you're yeah. in a good situation. And do you get rid of the gamma? You're saying if you knew it. No, I guess you you are basically have reduced the situation. It's about estimating the top eigenvalue of the large gap. That would seem. Yeah. Uh, okay. If, if your estimate is not exact, like yeah, I guess the question is like how good it has to be I estimate think, of the top eigenvalue, like if it's I not exactly one. You think it works as long as the, because the problem is not is the small eigenvalue. The problem is is the gap gap. Like you estimate is good enough, so I guess like so, yeah. up to I one half. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I missed so uh, I confused myself. Okay, let me try to arise. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah to complete. Yeah, that's a good point. That's also all. Yeah, no, because before I mean, when we were talking, I was thinking, oh, there's this duality that yeah, kind of Q and D minus Q, you should be able to pick the smallest one kind of for free. Yeah, so I guess it's a bit of a situation yeah. that half of your value, so yeah. you can have a small one. Right. But I guess if, if somehow the number of things you want to estimate is, is I mean, if Q scales linear with D, then anyways, there's no hope, right? That you yeah. Need to be squared because there's so much to output. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess the sweet, uh, the, the, the interesting regime, or one interesting regime would be like sublinear 
mm. Q, but still so large that maybe this bound is the same voice than linear. <laughs> Like yeah, I think in my my two thirds something. Yeah, I think in my my I mean, for example, in the PCA case, principal component analysis case, we would like to think about Q is roughly constant. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah I think then of course yeah, I think yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So probably also the yeah, where most meaning is in the top end space. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, I mean one reason we start this project is sort of uh, at the very beginning, Ronald and I was thinking about how to quantize some complex optimization algorithm. And then we realized like in one subroutine, we really need to, we really like to have a quantum speed up for approximating the top uh, eigenvector and then we start uh, <laughs> these projects. <laughs> cool, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the, I mean, by the way, here's an, like in a page rank example, right? That's like a, like a major example. Right? But then there are like some upper rounds that are quite different, for example. You know, like the top eigen is one. Right? Yeah, or like you actually know some things. You yeah, know, yeah. In the page rank, yeah, I think you yeah, just yeah, know that the top eigen is one, it's different. normalized, mm -hmm. and everything is very nice. Yes. And in that case, maybe there might be some possibility to speed up, you know, in part in that particular example. Yeah, but the, I think that one one and of course in page rank you don't care about top Q. Yeah, but the, another thing is like in the classical case, I mean, we are not necessarily have the quantum access to the entries of matrix, right? I mean, sometimes if you try to write down the whole matrix, you already cost so much of the time, say mm -hmm. D square time, mm -hmm. right? So so in this case, it's not really that advantage. So what we are thinking about is we are allowed to compute the entries of AIJ sort of easily or by myself. Mm -hmm. And then in this case, we should be able to do some quantum superposition queries to the entries of AIG and then let's just sort of say that. So maybe to, I guess, maybe for some context, correct me if I'm wrong, like, I guess the question is like, okay, if you have some classical data set and you first have to load it to a quantum computer, right, then there's no sublinear uh, speed up anyways. So, mm -hmm. so where sublinear now means less than D squared, mm -hmm. so size the matrix. Mm -hmm. So then people have been thinking, I guess, in the community about, oh, are there smart data structures and so on? Mm -hmm. But then also these algorithms sometimes have been dequantized. So mm -hmm. that's actually, you can also classically by replacing quantum access with some L2 sampling access and so on. So mm -hmm. it's a very nuanced kind of, Yes, exactly. So, so I guess that the, the sweetest part right. is kind of when actually your matrix is sort of implicitly represented, right? That's exactly. what you're saying. Yes, uh, I think. Yeah. But this would be what I'm going to say would be probably impossible. You know, think A is a black box, just sample D2 to the 1.5 entries and some output. This is impossible, right? Uh, you're thinking like some sketching kind of thing where you replace. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Sure. I guess yeah, the, I mean, like input is given again classically, but you don't read all. Ah, I see. Yeah. That's what yeah. I, if, I think. If that, that is part probably. Like, yes, I think. Like, I think it's. Uh, I mean, classically, I think. Uh, uh, in terms of number of sample, let us say, think about the principal component the cases or the covariance estimation cases, you have a bunch of samples and they want to estimate the covariance of those samples. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in this case, I think uh, you anyway needs say D, D many samples, which each sample is a D dimension mm -hmm. effect. Yeah. So in this case, the D square is sort of tight. I mean, because you need to collect D times D many things, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think in I mean in this case uh, we you can yeah for the quantum case you should able to have some advantage sort of something like that. Um, I mean it's that's kind of I, mean, I forget a bit I mean we we talk the scaling stuff that we've been working on right I mean people study the spiked model mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. where sometimes I don't know like it's I don't know it's very weird you know where they yeah in practice yeah, yeah, run. Exactly. Yeah, so if you don't have worst case data, right, but say if some from some Gaussian model or like some, something nice, then you can come out do better. Like, like even a constant number of other samples could be enough sometimes. Yeah. yeah, actually, I mean, the, the low bound uh, is sort of from just, just to consider the spark, spark the mark, I think. The yeah. D square over square root of gamma is the low bound for the spark mark. So that's amazing. Like uh, in the worst case, finding the type of I approximated the type of even factor is not the hardest instance you can think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's yeah.
comes comes back again. Oh yeah, sorry. I, in terms for the lower bound, I I, I didn't I understand exactly. Like so, so the, did you say you have some Q dependent lower bound or nothing yet? Is no, no, answer? we don't have. Oh, but we want. But like, have you like tried to look at kind of you know just a natural generalization? What you had like a rank Q projection uh, on some like big you know uh, plus a plus a. I think that for the thing? for the rank Q projectors, yeah. I think the Q D will be the tight. Will be the tight things and uh, which is sort of match the our, our region upper bound. I mean, I mean, in the setting of finding the rank Q projectors, we assume like uh, for each query would we would access to the block encoding of the say rank Q projectors, and then in this case Q times D over epsilon number of queries to list is tight. Yeah, this is Huawei. But so in your proof, I mean, you do Q equals one. I mean, you basically do a random rank one projector and you get this e to the 1.5 lower bound. So somehow, what, why? Why does. You mean why does this cannot generate? Yeah, I mean, of course, it could be just hard. I mean, I don't, I don't, it's more like, like, is there philosophically an obstruction or could one hope that, well, I don't know. With some like spark of genius, uh, which therefore not come from me. Um, yeah. So yeah. So maybe you are right. Maybe for the top Q projectors, maybe it's possible. Like, like quasi, you know, like maybe just take a Q uh, IID plus minus one vectors. Look at the you know normalized like U U dagger plus a Gaussian perturbation or something. Um, yeah. We I, I th actually we tried. I think actually we tried something like the we have a bunch of. Uh, I mean, say, like you say, you want, you want a transpose, okay, you yeah, two, you two transpose, something like that. And then we want to find off Q, but the, at the end, we don't. It's a clear how to analyze. Right? Yeah, yeah. The issue is like, we don't know how to analyze yeah, so. get the points like that. Yes, sir. And we also really like to have a Q dependency lower bound or the gamma dependency lower bound. But for the gamma dependencies, like the Gaussian error, we don't know how to adjust the, the standard deviation of Gaussian error correctly to end up with the correct the gaps. Because of you, I mean, the right now, the, I mean, the, the Gaussian, I mean, the, 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 the spectrum, uh, the, the, the operator now of the Gaussian noisy matrix is roughly the small constant, right? And then in this case, you want to adjust the gap, and then you should rescaling then, but the, we have some trouble to sort of say like at the end, what the correct the, 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 the value, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because most of the people are, I mean, most of the random metrics you know, emphasize under the points like, okay, this operator now of your random matrix is a big constant, right? With high, really, really high probability. But the, not really lots of people emphasize like how you can control the constant to be like uh, I want this constant to be something like between one and the one point one. I think in our case we use the binary row. Binary row is saying something like that. The uh, almost surely your operator yeah, node is yeah. roughly two. Yeah, yeah. I think that's quantitative bounds as well, right? Like how like as a function of d, like I mean, people have. I think there's yeah like, like tail bounds, like in the sense of. Yeah, but the but the uh, yeah, let me think. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we use Bain's rule, and uh, it's actually with uh, I mean, almost sure it's two, right? Operator down is two. You you have the 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 bounded uh, first moment. And, uh, okay, so maybe this. Yeah. So what's the problem we had? Uh, yeah, let me think. Yeah, it's sort of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let me think what's the problem here. I had an impression this is a super annoying issue when we try to sort of rescale the standard deviation. You can see we choose the, the I mean the standard deviation instead of one over D, we choose something like 10 to the six. Yeah. <laughs> one over 10 to the six times uh, one over D, something like that. And uh, I forget the uh, reason, but the uh, um, yeah, there's some, some, some issues with that. Yeah, I will check, uh, we, uh, we can check off that, but, but I think uh, it's not easy to directly to adjust, to plug in the gamma dependency. Yeah. Ooh.
Uh, I would be very surprised if, if uh, at least not square root of k would would come out. I I think that's a good idea, but but Mike suggested that that you just take k of those and add it up and hide that. <laughs> so 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 what uh, so what Mike said. I, I, uh, there could be a lot of like mathematics, but I think in the end you should get square root of k. Uh, at least, I mean, you should get something. Um, that would be my guess. So it feels like those are the hard instances, right? Or like the the ones like if you had to pick ones that are hard to distinguish, you would probably pick these, right? Yeah, true. Some sense, so. Yeah, that's true. We also think that this should be the correct yeah. uh, hard instance to think about. Of course, how to analyze it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for the very nice talk. And uh, see you guys. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. See you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>